Hello everybody, I'm Oliver, this is Chaotic People File, and every bit of my body hurts. Happy New Year! <laughs> Hi, so this is the first video that I am recording in 2023. It is not the first video I uploaded, but it is the first one that I am recording. First of all, I'm okay, my body hurts because I took a dance class after like one or two weeks and this was like a very sort of contemporary influenced class, so there was floor work, there was like a lot of intense stuff. I also took two classes back to back, which is normal for me, but because this class was so intense, I shouldn't have done that. I didn't know it was going to be like that, to be honest. I really loved it, it was a great choreo, I just am very bruised. Such are the perils of dancing. In any case, I want to thank you all for the great response to my coming out video. In case you haven't checked it out, I'm gonna link it down below and in the eye as always. People who commented or wrote to me privately, thank you very much. It's just really nice to have the support. And also, I really enjoyed filming that video because I reviewed nine books all having to do with bodies and I just had a lot of fun doing it. I hope to do not a video quite like that, but you know, similar sort of theme reviews in the future. I have to say though, and this has been bothering me, is that in the last sort of proof watch, I accidentally deleted two little clips where I said that earlier on in the year, in my Portugal book haul, I had come out as non-binary and that everyone had been super supportive at that time and that I was really grateful for it. The bit that is on the video is, however, things have changed very drastically or something like that. When I rewatched that, once it was posted, I was like, fuck. But you know, it happens. I am only human and I was tired of editing. I'm always tired of editing by the point I finish editing videos, so it's fine. It's fine. You all got the memo. It's fine. But yeah, I just wanted to address it because it bothers me. It's like such a small thing, but it really does bother me that like I made that mistake. One last little thing, I apologize for any background noise. It's been pretty on and off today, but I really want to record today because time and also like I'm in the mood for it today. So I will try to get rid of as much background noise as I can. I am not sure what they are doing out there, but whatever it is, I wish they would stop it. <laughs> I'm having pretty severe Santiago flashbacks. Today, I am going to tell you about my 20 favorite reads of 2022. Now, if you've been around here for a while, you might know that I usually do a non-fiction wrap-up and a fiction wrap-up. And if you've been here for even longer, I used to do best reads. I changed this in 2021, I think, because I was tired of trying to be objective, quote unquote. And this is the same reason I stopped giving star reviews, because my personal feelings sometimes conflicted with what I viewed as the quality of the book, in the way that even how we assess quality, of course, it's subjective. But we can sometimes distance ourselves and say, well, I didn't personally like love this book, or it hasn't stayed with me that much, but I did like see how it was working and what it was doing, and I think that's very admirable, even though it's mainly not my thing, that sort of thing. I think it's completely possible. Again, it's not fully objective, that doesn't really exist, but I don't know, it's a different sort of assessment. So I do do favorite reads, I just think top sounds better. I don't know why. In any case, I also fused both categories because I was having so much trouble placing some of the books, specifically with poetry. I was like, I just don't know, especially because of the poetry collection that made it onto the list. Definitely does not feel like fiction. And again, when I separated the genres, I was more compelled to evaluate in terms of quote-unquote objective quality. My top example for last year is Heavy by Kisa Lehmann, which is an amazing memoir. I objectively think it is one of the best books that I read last year. However, 
it didn't have the same not emotional resonance because like i literally cried after that book i don't have the same attachment to it the way i have to other books here that like i want to reread so much so because of that it just made more sense and then also i just really didn't want to edit two videos this year <laughs> yeah i really love this list i'm really excited to share it with you hello this is oliver from the future if i look terrible it's because i am dressed for dance class. Also, I am in dire need of a haircut. Like, what is this? What is, ugh. If I sound terrible, it's because I've got a really bad cold. Um, I made a pretty big mistake with this list. I sort of had a first draft and then didn't correct as I should have. This has two implications. After this, I will record a clip of a book that I forgot. I did the thing where it was so obvious that I was going to include it and very high up on the list that I just keep forgetting to include it for some reason. It was insane. So that means that most of the books are actually not in order anymore. So I will have to cut most of the segues. Let's continue with the video. All right, this is starting from least favorite to absolute most favorite. Number 20 is Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. This is a textbook about reading and creating to a degree, but also understanding how comics function, sort of their internal structure, the elements through which this particular medium signifies. And it's so good because it uses the medium to explain itself. I have never read anything like it. I know that Will Eisner and Scott McCloud both have more books like this, but this is the baseline. This is so good. It is very well designed, of course. It explains things in such a concrete, amazing way. It's also a joy to read. Like, I love his open-mindedness about what qualifies as comics. And also, I love his true enthusiasm for it without sacrificing the rigor. If you're interested in graphic novels and comic books, you definitely need to check this out. It's so enjoyable, but at the same time, so informative. And again, we'll return to it over and over again. Number 18, yet another nonfiction book, Eat Up by Ruby Tando. In case you don't know or you haven't watched my On Having a Body video, this is a collection of essays mostly and meditations on food and our relationship to it. It also has recipes and personal anecdotes and data and it's just so good in a way that feels like a friend just talking to you, but at the same time, it is full of information and data and sort of reflections that I feel like I need to remind myself of all of the time. And yeah, it's it's just really good. Because I returned to the introduction so much, I just couldn't not have it here. Next one is Crossroads by Jonathan Franzen. I had a bit of a journey with this book. Let me tell you what it is about first. It is about this family in the 70s. Russ is the patriarch and he is a reverend who has had some troubles with the community before, but he's sort of still doing his thing. His wife, Marion, is a brilliant but deeply troubled woman and they have three children, one of whom is in college and the other two are still in high school. One of them, Becky, is this popular teenager who's trying to figure out what's up basically and then the youngest one they have four sorry it's just like the actual youngest you don't have dedicated chapters for i think he might surface in the following books because this is the first part of a loosely connected trilogy that follows this family through the ages and supposedly it will reach the 2020s so that will be super interesting to see the oldest three are the ones that have dedicated chapters and the youngest one of those, Perry, is battling addiction and sort of grandeur delusions. It took me a while to get into it compared to the other Jonathan Franzons that I've read where I've just loved them right away. But once I was in, I was so in. These people felt real and it, the plot is just exciting enough and the way it's constructed slowly I didn't think it would necessarily make my top of the year at the time but when I was compiling the list I was like no how could I not include this it's just so rare that a book that is this long doesn't have any sort of 
loose middles. I do think the beginning is kind of hard to get into, but once you're in, you're in. And so it, it just went like this for me all the time. And I love the ending. I, I couldn't get enough of it. Jonathan Francis is just like such a great writer. He is very traditional in a way, but his linguistic choices always make so much sense. He is not trying too hard to be historically accurate, but in some choices of adjectives, in some choices of slang, he achieves this sense of verisimilitude and historical accuracy that is very natural and I feel like it's really hard to achieve in historical fiction, especially one that is not as self-conscious or as historical as, let's say, something that was set in the Victorian period. So yeah, I just really enjoyed it. It was like a great example of a very, very solid family saga and I can't wait for the next one. And as I've said of all of these books, I would definitely reread it in spite of being over 500 pages. So there you go. Next book, also a fiction book, but this time a short story collection, There Are Little Kingdoms by Kevin Barry. I read this for the Overdue Book Club book in March, so I will link that video down below. I do have that review up for that one. Bless, didn't think about this book very much for the following months. But then when I started compiling this list, I realized I remembered so many of the stories. The sense of place, the sense of playfulness. He's a wordsmith, as people say, but in this case, I think it's completely justified. Most of the stories I loved, I just think he's a great author. I don't know how to phrase this exactly, but if you're interested in seeing the quote-unquote more traditional lineage of contemporary Irish fiction, but the good side, not the stale, boring side, I think Kevin Barry is like top-notch. You can't go wrong with him. Another Irish book, this time non-fiction, Handiwork by Sarah Baum. I just adore Sarah Baum and I hope to read the other two books that I haven't read by her this year, definitely, because I just love her so much. The way she writes, fragmented as it is, resonates with me on such a profound level. I actually wrote two papers doing my master's on her work and Handiwork is a bit of a diary, a bit of a meditation on craft. It's very, very sparse. It's like this big. Each page has not more than two or three. Sometimes it's only one. It has a very specific and interesting rhythm. It has pictures. And insofar as it has narrative, it is first her meditations on craft and calling on other sort of theorists of craft, also craft as it relates to her father who passed away and was a bit of a hobbyist and her grandfather. So there's this lineage of craft and making stuff. And then also she's preparing for an exhibition. She's been crafting these birds. And there's this point in the book where she realizes after having made a hundred birds that her style has changed and the hundred and first bird that she makes is actually the only good one and the rest have only been leaning to this bird and so she needs to discard the others and it's just so heartbreaking but at the same time begs the question is this one bird worth the other hundred that she had to discard and it's just lovely i do think it's because she's so sincere and because each paragraph actually is really well written that it works i think when it comes to this sort of fragmentary kind of melancholy style, it can get very cold and very self-indulgent. And I think what is so good about Sarah Baum is that yes, it is sincere and yes, it's a little bit meandering, but in a way where it's always precise, it's always with a purpose. And I just love it. I love it so much. Another book that resonated with me on a very personal level and that I have also reviewed, and that is Becoming a Man by P. Carl. This is P. Carl's memoir about life after transition and what it means to be treated as a white cis-passing man having lived 50 years as 
a feminist lesbian and it's just fascinating it is really well written it is also a very particular perspective it's not outdated in a bad way it's just that ideas on gender and queerness have evolved so much in the past let's say 10 years or 15 years that of course P. Carl's perspective will feel a bit dated but in a way that P. Carl is very aware of and he explores and he reflects on. So it is actually really enriching to have. As I said in my review, he is very candid and open to other ways of being and conceiving gender, while also being very honest about his own vision of his own gender and admitting to things that sometimes might be a bit unlikable, but he goes there and I really admire that. Other than that, this is really well written and I like how theory is interspersed with personal narrative. That is something that I admire a lot in writing in general and especially memoirs. A fiction book like no other, Dear Committee Members by Julie Schumacher. I just love this book so much. It is an epistolary book comprised mostly of letters of recommendations that are emails. It's about this professor in this English department writing all these emails and letters of recommendations for students and he is very grumpy and sort of righteous about the role of English in society and how everything's going to hell basically. But he's also incredibly passionate and incredibly generous when he wants to. His situation is a bit hilarious and he's very exasperating. So if you need to like your characters, I think this is not the right book for you. But I was really moved by his passion. I was honestly annoyed by some of the letters that he wrote but also I laughed out loud by the end of it I don't know if the message is very optimistic other than like well it's fucked up but we love it and we can try and change it a little bit or like try to make positive impact through our own actions so it's just very good um i really recommend it if you're into campus novels and i know how it can seem that i have less to say about it than the high spot warrants it's just a very well executed book that also made me laugh and that i think about all the time and i want to go back to and that is really admirable especially with epistolary formats which can be so cringy and so forced and feel overwrought. This is pitch perfect. The voice feels so careful and real, but the way each letter interacts with the other and the way the narrative advances makes you realize that the book is not aligning itself with the narrator, which always is so hard to pull off. And Julie Schumacher does it. So Dear Committee Members, a great campus novel. Next book is a fascinating case and I will explain why. It is All This Could Be Different by Sarah Thancombe Matthews. I'm going to link my review of this book that I did for the Riverside Bookshop down below so you can read it and see sort of my fresher take. I thought for so long that this was going to be my favorite book of the year but after a strong cooling period I realized that it was mostly surprised. Like, I still love this book. I think it's a great book. I think it's so well done. And I will get to the plot in a second. But it made me realize how big a role expectations and surprise play in my initial reaction to a book. So this book is about a queer woman called Sneha. She moves to Milwaukee, I think, to start a new job at a startup company and she's a bit of an overachiever, she is a rock star and there she finds it hard to connect to people, she realizes the amount of trauma she's been carrying with her, she starts dating this dancer Marina but like the relationship is very fraught, she also realizes that her ch shiny new job might not be all that, her project for this model life begins to crumble. It is a really good commentary on queerness, on the economic climate, on startup culture, on grind culture, on how precarious 
the idea of the model minority and meritocracy is, and I found it absolutely fascinating. I call it the ultimate millennial novel, and here is where the surprise part came. I think it's because I've read so many of these books, like in the line of Sally Rooney or Natasha Brown, Nisha Dolan, what I loved about this book was that I think it's the best example of that kind of writing. Very subtle, very subdued, very distant, but in a way where I think the text gives rise to much, much more. I just really, really enjoyed that. Seeing how the commentary arose so organically from the text and also how the people in this book actually text and talk like actual people in a way that feels very true to life. I was just very impressed with this book. And of course, her being the daughter of immigrants, although that is not my particular case, she is very aware of her almost immigrant status in a way that I also think resonated with me a lot. So yeah, I think it's a very good example of what it is. And I think as a millennial novel, it works really, really well. However, I've been reading so many books after that, that are just so exciting in a way that this book isn't. Even the book that comes after this on the list, it's just more creative and more ambitious. And it's made me rethink a lot what I want from literature. And I think the reason I loved this book so much at the time, apart from the fact that it is objectively good, it's just that it was just such a good example of like contemporary writing of what a lot of people are doing, but that better than most people are doing it. Does that make any sense? I think it does in a way. I also want to say, you will hear more about this because we will film a video. Ash also read this for a project that we're doing. And if you don't know who Ash is, check out my latest video, which is very fun and a bit of a romp. And we talked about 27 books that we may or may not have read and may or may not read in the future. Link down below and in the eye as always. But yeah, they read it and they absolutely despised it. And they'll explain why in that video. So wait for that. But I think it's an interesting contrast to my own opinion, because I think that a lot of the reasons they hated it, I loved it. I still recommend it, especially if you're into sort of millennial fiction. I think this is one of the best examples of that. However, maybe if I read it for the first time this year, after reading everything that I've been reading, I would have been less impressed. Annihilation by Jeff Bandermeer. I have not reviewed this book for the book club and I will do so at some point, I promise. I uh, devoured this book. I could not stop reading. Basically, it is about four scientists or I think not all of them are technical scientists, but like professional women who go into this expedition and it hasn't been the first expedition into Area X and it's an exploration mission, right? And there have been, I think, 10 previous ones or maybe 12, around that number. Um, the narrator, who is the biologist, her boyfriend, I want to say, maybe husband, disappeared in one of these expeditions. It was the first time I read Jeff Vandermeer and I was very hesitant to pick him up because I'm not close to the idea of weird fiction. I just need my weird fiction to also be really well crafted and not be weird for weirdness sake. So like, I really like Lovecraft, for example, racism outside. And this is so Lovecraft inspired, by the way. But anyways, I shouldn't have worried because it is extraordinary. It is so eerie and atmospheric in a way that's so subtle. And the way it comments on the nature of experience and language and how organizations sort of use these people in certain ways. Oh, I just, when I finished, I almost went out and bought the entire trilogy right away, but I didn't because of what I've mentioned in my goals video, also linked down below and in the eye, where I need to just basically be reading my own book. So I don't think I will read any more Jeff Vandermeer this year. That might change. It's just, again, only because I need to pace myself with the book buying. But if I have an excuse or if anyone wants to gift me the second part, I would be very grateful, let's just say. In any case, I just really loved it. I can see why people wouldn't like it, but I was in it. I was in it from the beginning. I read this 
during a day trip and I sat down on several occasions just to read a little bit more. I just couldn't stop. It was so good, so impactful. I I want to read so much more. How to Order the Universe by Maria Jose Ferrada. I forgot who translated this into English, but I will check and put it in the description as always. This I read for the Booktube Prize and I am so grateful. It is about this young girl whose father is a traveling salesman. She one day starts accompanying him unbeknownst to her mother. It's just so so heartbreaking in a very tender way. The child narrator voice, it's so well achieved. I know a lot of people will struggle with it because they don't like the perspective period, but I think this one is worth giving a try because it's a short book and also the scope of experience is very limited, so it works really, really well. She's a bit precocious, but not in a massively uh, unbelievable way. She's still very naive and very just sincere and wants to genuinely spend time with her dad, who we understand is very absent. So like this is the only time they connect. And it's so interesting because the mom is the actual parent, but she is going through her own stuff that is never really explored. And it's so interesting that he's the absent parent, but like she is the one who's absent from the narrative. And I think that mirrors how sometimes kids will have illusions about the parents they see less because that parent doesn't have to deal with the grind of everyday life, with the boring, with the mundane, with the strict. And so it's just very well achieved. It's so charming. It's so well constructed. The way the narrative develops is very interesting. I am just really grateful that I got to read it and I will definitely reread it at some point. I should stop saying that because I would reread all of these books. That is the point of them being on this list. Another short story collection and also Irish, Intimacies by Lucy Caldwell. Every single story is good and that is so unusual. They are all about women in mostly contemporary Ireland, but there are some other locations. The stories are very touching. A lot of them had me nearly sobbing, but at the same time, they are slightly whimsical. The ease with which Lucy Caldwell allows these little sort of off-kilter situations or remarks or details. It's just so masterful. She's such a good author. I really want to read Multitudes now, which is her previous collection. This one is often described as the women from Multitudes have grown up and this is intimacies. That sounds amazing. I really want to read her former collection. I think back to these stories all of the time and I am just so enthusiastic about it. I've recommended this book to a lot of people as I've said. I also hand sell it a lot and I've heard nothing but good things back. If you are in the mood for contemporary short stories that also don't feel very samey and if you're interested in contemporary female experience and especially in Irish contemporary literature, this is just amazing. Let's move to number nine which is Angels in America by Tony Kushner. I am so so late to this party. I should have read this years ago. I bought this book, I still remember, in 2019 in Books Upstairs, which is a bookshop that I really love in Dublin. And I just didn't read it until December. <laughs> This is a play, I should say that. It is a classic of theatre in general, but also a classic of queer literature in particular. I thought I was going to study it for the masters because it was on the syllabus and then the professor changed it. I was not very happy about that. But anyways, I got to it eventually, which is what matters. This is divided into two parts. The first section is titled Millennium Approaches and the second one is titled Perestroika. It is thematically a meditation on the AIDS crisis and homosexuality in the 80s, but also just America and sort of the American dream as it's coming crumbling down and it's almost always crumbling down. Specifically, it is about this closeted gay Mormon guy who is a lawyer and starts working for this other lawyer who doesn't consider himself gay, but is at least in practice. And sort of that interrogates the idea of a homosexual identity that is being consolidated in the second half of the 20th century for political reasons, right? And then it is also about two gay men who were a couple, one of them becomes sick with HIV and then the other abandons him basically. It is an incredibly imaginative work. I 
great to see this on stage. I will watch the mini series, the film, the anti live version with Andrew Garfield, all of that I want to see. But reading it was such a great experience because I got to relish on the language, which is beautiful. It's a very Brechtian play insofar as it has a lot of defamiliarization and sort of alienating elements. It's supposed to be a sort of thwarted fantasia. It works. It really, really works. It takes the best of Brechtian theatre, but also pulses with life, which I feel like a lot of Brechtian theatre isn't. And yeah, it's just so moving and oh, there are a couple of monologues that I remember that just break my heart and I want to keep reading all of the time. I feel like even if it takes me a while to get back to the whole play, I will still like sometimes grab the book from my shelves and just read those monologues because they are so good. The next book, yes, this is the one that I forgot to include for some reason, is Someone Who Will Love You In All Your Damaged Glory by Raphael Bob Waxberg, I want to say. He's the creator of Bojack Horseman and this is his collection of just wonderful, fantastic, mind-blowingly good short stories. What I love the most about this is how casually experimental it is. It just thinks so outside of the box in a way that's quite organic. And my prime example for this is there is this narrator explaining how the um, game code word or code name works and as he goes on to explain it becomes clear that the couple at the center of this game are having a party and they have a lot of couple issues and the whole scene or evening unfolds. I've seen this sort of format used to storytell quite a lot actually but the way it's done here is first of all, very organic and very endearing and it hits emotionally in a way that I haven't seen with other examples of that. I recently read a similar thing where the focalization was all over the place, the format made no sense and it's just hard to do this well. The first story is it starts with like big letters and then it ends with it's like two pages and it ends like really tiny and it makes sense like it has a reason why this is the case then there is a short story in told in microfiction short stories it's just so good. The sensibility is exactly like Bojack Horseman in the sense that it is a little self-deprecating, also funny, but very, very sad, but sad in a very tender, earnest way where a lot of people are cynical, but like the whole tone of the work isn't. Also, I love this edition. I had to order it from the US, I think. And I say I think because I did it through like a secondhand bookshop, but I think it's from the US. It's just like so perfect to flip through. I love the quality of the pages. It is the perfect amount of flop, not like too much, but also not like hard, you need to break the spine sort of binding. And the cover is so perfect for what the book is. A high benchmark, in my opinion, to what being playful with form can do for content in a way that is not pretentious, that is not gimmicky, but it's also not apologetic for using these forms. It's taking advantage of form to the best of the content. And the content speaks to our reality and comments on it and it's cathartic and it's painful and it's just so good. So yeah, I really highly recommend it. Next one is another really moving and very different sort of book, Here by Richard McGuire. This is a graphic novel that is mostly silent. It is an exploration of time, scale and place and basically just follows the happenings of this spot through time. And by through time, I mean from before history and the future. It is fascinating. It is beautifully illustrated. It is unlike anything I've experienced before. And also it is one of those situations where even seeing this as a video, for example, would not have been the same. It is one of those rare cases where the medium is so integral to the point of the book and uses it to such a great degree that you are just in awe. I would say this is half graphic novel, half just artwork, like art product. You don't read it as you would read other graphic novels, but again, the placement of the pictures, the details, the pacing even, is just so interesting and I really highly recommend it. If you like 
sort of silent meditations on space and landscape. It's just so good. And again, unlike anything I've read before or since. Another interesting take on the graphic form is Asterisk Polyp by David Matsukeli. This is much more traditional in both story and composition in a way. David Matsukeli is like a big deal in comics as well. And this is, I think, his most famous sort of non-comic book work. It's about this architect, Asteris Polyp, who is a paper architect. He's very celebrated, but he's never had any of his buildings constructed, basically. And so he earns his living by designing things that win awards and teaching and writing. And at the beginning of the book, his house burns down. And so he just moves out of the city. But as that story progresses, his also reminiscing about his great love, a woman who was unlike him, who is so fond of explanations and precision and geometry. She is a different type of artist, a visual artist who is very free and likes abstractions, but in a very lose emotional way, whereas he likes abstractions in a very concrete way, if you see what I mean. It's not only that the story it's really good and the ending was shockingly surprising. You're like, I can't believe he went there. I just really can't believe it. It's a bit ridiculous, but in a way that makes sense for the narrative. But also the way it uses form is astonishingly clever and it is a very beautiful, distinctly drawn graphic novel. When it's just Asterisk Polyp, he sees the world one way and the woman sees the world another way. And so they are drawn in different ways. And then suddenly those start to merge. And then when they have conflict, they start to separate again. And that is just one example of the things that are going on on this graphic novel. I just really recommend it. If you are trying to get into graphic novels, actually. The only problem is that it's a bit pricey. I got this out of the library. I do hope to get it at some point in the future, not this year, definitely, but at some point. So if you can get it from the library, I would recommend that. I would absolutely recommend the physical book, however, because it's like a big, chunky graphic novel that is a delight to page through. But yeah, it is um, very pricey, but totally worth it if you have the cash to spare. Trans Like Me, another book that I reviewed in the On Having a Body video. This I listened to as an audiobook, but I would definitely want to reread and have a physical copy of. It's both memoir, both sort of a meditation on transness and gender identity, not only as it pertains oneself, but also as how other people perceive it and interact with it and how often systems are in the best case scenario, not designed to accommodate trans people and at the worst to exclude trans people. It is so good, so helpful. If you have to read one book on transness, I would recommend this one. I think it benefits also from C.N. Lester being non-binary, but also having had medical procedures to transition because it just provides such a unique perspective. Again, I'm not saying that all other perspectives are wrong or worthless. I want to read all of the trans books ever, but this one is so unique, so generous, so fascinating, and so meticulously crafted that I just can't recommend it highly enough. That was Trans Like Me by C.L. Lester. Number four is one of the best novels that I've read in a long time and that I really want to reread this year. I read an e-copy and I am desperate to get an actual physical book. So that might be one that I actually buy this year. This is Vladimir. This is about a 50-something professor of English literature whose husband has just been accused of sexual misconduct. And this has already happened when the book starts. Both of them are actually dealing with the fallout of that. And at the same time, a new professor, very hot, very smart, arrives at the department with his own wife, and that is Vladimir. And immediately she starts crushing on him. So it's a meditation on gender politics in academia, about sex and desire and art, and the role desire plays in art making and especially writing. It has such a compelling voice. She's so unlikable, but also compelling in many ways because you can tell she's a great professor, right? And no one complains that she isn't, but a lot of people feel uncomfortable being taught by the wife of a rapist. And here's the thing, she doesn't think he's a rapist in the sense that she thinks 
these liaisons were all consensual and she doesn't think there is anything wrong with a professor sleeping with a student per se and so already you're like ooh, but it's a first person narrative by the way so you see how she rationalizes things and how she's internalized so much misogyny even though she kind of wants to be a liberated woman and she is so so ready to examine to a degree her own thoughts and sort of the contrast of that and sort of the clash in ethic standards and conceptions of what constitutes power and how it's enforced and how it's gendered. It's also just fun. It's so fun to read because it is so sexy. And the third act is just so bonkers and so insane. It's one of those books that is so now and the comments are so now, but also could have been written any time. Of course, it's a conversation with a lot of literature, including Lolita. It is no coincidence that this is called Vladimir. He does unreliable self-conscious narration as well as Lolita does. And that is such high praise. This is a book you can either love or hate, but you won't be indifferent to it. Number three is one of the reasons I couldn't do separate lists, and that is Homie by Dennis Smith. This is my first time reading a uh, Dennis Smith collection cover to cover, but it is not my first time reading their poetry. I actually assigned some of their poetry for a course that I was the TA of. The professor kindly asked me to suggest some contents and I suggested poems from Don't Call Us Dead. I keep saying Homie is their first collection. Actually, I think it's the other way around. I think Don't Call Us Dead is the first one. I'm sorry if that is not the case. Anyways, I will read Don't Call Us Dead this year, although I don't own it. It's just so good. I suggested their poetry for the spoken word section because they do interact with that tradition a lot. However, this is just so above and beyond anything. The imagery, the space, the rhythm. So basically these are meditations on race and homosexuality and most importantly friendship. It is inspired by the death of one of Dene Smith's closest friends, I think. This is why I couldn't really call it fiction, because a lot of the poems are reacting to or discussing real race issues, real occurrences, and so it's just not fiction, if you see what I mean. There are so many poems in here that I loved. Some concrete poems, actually, where the shape of the poem mirrors the content, and even those you'd think, oh, this is gimmicky. No, it works so well. It's just so good. I don't know how to explain how carefully crafted every poem is literally one of my new gold standards for contemporary poetry. If it is not as good as this, I just, I don't want to read it. I'm sorry. So yeah, that was Homie by Donette Smith. If you want to get into poetry as well, I highly recommend this because the language is poetic, like it feels you're reading poetry, but it also it is full of concrete images. There is a lot of metaphoric language, but you don't need it to get emotions out of the poems in a way that you might need it for some other styles of poetry. It also has a lot of contemporary language, a lot of slang, and the way those interact is just so exciting and fresh and organic. I feel like a lot of people would get so much out of this. Okay, top two. I have been recording for so long. I think a lot of it will be cut, but this will still be a very long video, I think. In any case, number two, another genre problem. Astro Magazine. I keep thinking about this magazine all of the time. This was the first issue, the theme was ecstasy, and the second issue is coming out either in January or February. I'm definitely buying it. It's called Filth, and oh, I just can't wait. The subtitle for this magazine is the Magazine of International Writing, and they do live up to that name. They feature writers from everywhere, and they credit the translators. Not only do they credit the illustrators that sort of accompany some of the work, they also have illustrations as their own thing, their own entries. I would say like comic strips, but not all of them are like strips, if that makes sense. It's just so good. It has one of my favorite short stories of all time. It has poetry that I love and I keep thinking about. It has essays that I keep thinking about. A lot of that is available online. So if you would like to check that out, I will link to three of my favorite things. I will not tell you which ones down below so you can check them out. It is just such a beautiful 
well thought out journal that I urge you to pick it up because it's not that expensive and you really do get good bang for buck and it's a beautiful object that also is great in its content oh I just loved it so much there were a few pieces that I didn't love as much but overall I loved everything as a whole Astro Magazine second spot and then, if you saw my nonfiction November wrap up, you know what's going on, number one. It's In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. I didn't think that was going to be the case, especially because I was so reluctant to pick it up for a long time. I just feared that it was not going to be as good as everyone said, that it was going to be gimmicky because it is a memoir in sort of fragments, but it's actually amazing. This is a memoir about Carmen Maria Machado's incredibly abusive and toxic queer relationship, but it's also a meditation on queer relationships themselves and why we don't like to talk about abuse in queer relationships, which happens. Like, it's a relationship, it happens, but we so want to show that our relationships are valid, that we don't want to speak about abuse. And it's incredibly moving, but at the same time, it's so well constructed. It's also meditation on memoir as a genre. And so the dream house motif sort of repeats itself and varies in genre. And I keep citing this example, which is where I realized how genius this book was. I already loved it, but my concrete proof was in dream house as choose your own adventure. That section is just astonishingly good. And as I said, it plays on genre, but in a way that totally pays off. The mere idea that Carmen Maria Machado had to relieve all of this trauma and process all of this trauma in order to put it on page, but also revisit that page so much in order to craft such an intricate, delicate narrative. I appreciate it so much. I think it will help so many people that have been in these situations. I think this is a book that everyone needs to read. I keep quoting from it. I keep thinking about it. This is once again the gold standard against which all memoirs shall be evaluated. I will stop gushing now go read it, go read all of these books, they are all so good. And that was it, I cannot believe it, it was such a great reading year, and this year is shaping up to be even better. I am having that situation where I just want to read. I have so much stuff to do, and I don't want to do anything other than reading. I'm just reading so many great things. I am so excited to do more videos this year, not in quantity, but just videos that I'm excited about. Also catching up with things. I mean, I'm just so motivated to keep doing things. I was kind of dreading this upcoming year because there's a lot of change coming up and a lot of just uncertainty. But actually, it's been really nice. And also, I'm reading great stuff. And that is always a great feeling to have. Tell me, have you read any of these books? Do you want to read any of these books? You should. Then also, what were your top picks of last year? You can be as concise or as expansive as you want. I, I'm always looking forward to your comments and that's it. See you next time!